Hello, brothers and sisters in Hadra family. I recently received a correspondent with someone asking the question, what are bloodline battles? After posting the message, blood battles, in the courts of heaven, I realized I'd read you my notes of wisdom and revelation I received at the prayer camp in Uganda, but it probably didn't explain very well what blood battles were. So the Lord wanted me to do a teaching on these things. We learn they are to give a greater understanding to many believers who are facing blood battles. The scripture says, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. I didn't fully understand that scripture in my early years walking with Jesus, but boy do I get it now. Because too many Christians don't want to know about these things. Go any deeper in understanding spiritual things, or ignorantly think that none of these things affect them because they're covered by the blood. Recently, there was a couple of people I gave counsel to concerning their situations. One struggling in her marriage, and the other had a second miscarriage. Now understanding how generational iniquities work in our lives and issues in our bloodline and foundations can affect us so gravely when we don't know what's going on, I decided to share some of these things with them in hopes it would bring them revelation and understanding about their circumstance and the solution in knowing how to pray. They both didn't seem moved, but rather quoted scripture and said that they would continue to trust the Lord. So they didn't really receive all that I had told them and offered them to really battle the issues going on in their lives. So that scripture popped in my mind. My people perish for the lack of knowledge. Hosea 4, six. Blood battles are spiritual warfare battles that are being waged against you because it's in your bloodline. Like Pastor James mentioned, the enemy uses this to cause disorders and still destinies. So in order to reverse generational disorders that run in your bloodline or to restore wasted destinies, you have to win blood battles. There are demonic evil covenants that have been made with demons in the form of deities by someone in your bloodline, or even promises to Satan through secret societies that one of your family members have been a part of. These evil covenants have not been passed on to you and other members in your family because you carry the same blood. It's generational, and it's in your family bloodline. What defiles your destiny is the seed of your mother or seed of your father. Pastor James says, Defilement happens in the womb at the day of birth. Psalm 51.5 Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me, David says. Issues of the birth never show up in your birth. They are hidden from your knowledge. Do you know where your umbilical cord is? This is a question Pastor James asked us at the camp. When I sat with this question, I realized, no, I don't know where mine is. I don't think many of us know. It's cut at the hospital, and we hope they discard it. But like in Pastor James' case, and who knows in many cases, there are agents at the hospital. If not there, they are where they discard human waste. As you can see, guys, now coming out and planning parenthood, where we see that they have sold aborted fetuses and body parts on the black market. That is pure evil and demonic, the things that they use with body parts. So if they're selling babies that they've killed on the black market. Imagine the many other hospitals that sell placentas, they sell umbilical cords, they'll sell even the flesh off a little child's circumcision wound rather than discarding it on the black market because people use it for various different things. So you never know. So some can even use your blood and even use your umbilical cord for rituals. So I honestly encourage any pregnant woman to please ask your doctors for the umbilical cord and your placenta, and you get rid of it how you want to get rid of it, versus having the hospital keep it and discard it. Just saying. Seriously. For example, I know a friend who had birth was taken from his mother for a short while as the ladies of the community bathed him with local herbs. They said it makes the bones very strong and was for strength. Sure enough, he grew up and noticed he had abnormal strength, especially when he got into fights. He could easily pick up a man and just throw him. The first day he did that, it was his last, because it scared him. <clears throat> this strength, when he got angry and about to fight, he knew it could really hurt someone. So he made it a point to control his temper and to not get in any more fistfights during school. And onward, he hasn't. So the question now is, what was those herbs they bathed him with? Was it a ritual? What words did they speak over him that now he has a spirit of anger with him that takes on superhuman strength when he's about to fight. That sounds like a demon. This is a blood battle. That is why consecration is so important. You see, before we go into covenants, Pastor James Koala mentioned that what defiles your destiny is the seed of your mother and the seed of your father. 
The famine happens in the womb, and even in the land in the day of your birth. The issues of both never show up in birth. They are hidden from your knowledge, like what they did to you when you were born. What was spoken over you, prayed over you, were there any rituals or old superstitions done over you that your parents or grandparents got from their grandparents, doing it as your protection, but it was actually witchcraft. One thing he mentioned was, do you know where your umbilical cord is, as I mentioned? Do you know what they did with your foreskin as circumcision? Where the agents in the hospital or even family members can take this and do rituals on you? A great example is, as I was preparing this teaching, a friend of mine just had a baby here. And the mother-in-law came asking for the child's umbilical cord when it fell off, saying there's a family tree that they put all the umbilical cords. Um, no. <laughs> she didn't give it to her. And that's definitely witchcraft. Buying the child to a family deity of some sort. Tying the child to a family covenant. You see how Satan works? Whether it's through family rituals or ceremonies that seem innocent, or through a family shrine or deity or even a secret society, or a secret place, a secret forest, a secret tree, there is always a transaction, a promise or an agreement made for something in return. Satan will disguise himself in whatever form he comes in. He will insist that he wants an agreement with you, or agreement from your family, your bloodline, and the agreement is binding, and that is a covenant. And he knows that covenants can be broken. So you see, blood battles are found at the foundation. And what can the righteous do if the foundation is destroyed? Psalm 11.3 You must deal with the foundations of your family. Many times when you deal with the foundations, you will have counterattacks, but do not let that detour you. Stand strong. Remember Pastor James' testimony when he began to deal with the family foundations, give his life to Jesus. He got cancer and almost died, and was blind. A whole year of suffering, but after that the Lord healed him, miraculously. And look what he's doing now. There are several areas in our body you wash several times, and that's the same with your soul. It must be washed several times. Their ancestral seed of covenants, which is an agreement your ancestors made to another god or ancestral spirit. Like making an agreement with the spirit of someone who died to watch over your family. There's meditations of your thoughts. These are thinkings of those who have been in your family. It could be evil wishes upon people. And they forgot that God hears our thoughts and that a sin to murder in your heart or think evil of your brother is sin. And there's declarations of your ancestors. Your ancestors could have made several evil declarations of people or evil declarations over your family. This covenant of your ancestors. Your family could have made a vow or promise to the family shrine or deity or family secret society or secret place like I said tree or forest by making a pact of some sort. Secret agreement in the mountains, secret places in the water that you don't know about that's affecting you now. There are some doctrines in the church that teach once you come to Christ, you're already delivered. That he has taken every curse upon him, as it says in the scripture, so the Christian is liberated. You just have to declare it and walk in it. When something bad happens or receive a bad report, just decree and declare the word of God by faith. Now there's definitely some truth to that by actively walking in faith despite how you feel what you see. However, if that was the case, then we wouldn't have so many messed up Christians dealing with trauma baggage, bad cycles they see in their families, having demonic attacks, oppression, even possession. I've heard some pastors who teach this doctrine say, if you're a Christian dealing with the above, it's because you're not saved. What? Christians, we suffer just like the world. Jesus said that we would, but the difference is we have a liberator. We have a mediator. We have a savior who has overcome the world's troubles and encourages us that we can do the same with his help by faith. So as Pastor James said, Salvation is by grace. It's free, but deliverance will cost you. You must go deeper. You must do the work and your foundation, and the Lord desires us to. All through scripture, he raised one in all generations to rise up and be a priest, to be an intercessor, to be a mediator in their families. David was one. Abraham was one. Jacob, Isaac was one. Joseph was one. Esther was one. Mary, Blessed Mother, she was one. It could go on and on and on and on, all through scripture. The apostles, they were one. They stood for the truth. They followed Christ, and they suffered terribly. So there's issues in our family bloodline that the Lord desires to raise up one or two in the family who would serve him and serve him alone, and be willing to fight these covenants 
and, and deal with the foundation so that the rest of the family members can be liberated. The rest of the generation can receive God's mercy. As he says that those who love him, that he will, they will receive mercy to the fourth generation. I then read the chapter Ezekiel 18. And if I can be honest, it made me ponder because it seems to directly contradict the idea of generation curses or the sins and iniquities of your ancestors affecting you in any way. Because I begin to contemplate and ask the Lord concerning that after reading this chapter. And it says, the one who sins will die. Verse 18 says, the word of the Lord came to me. What do people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? Their parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. For everyone belongs to me, the parents as well as the child. Both alike belong to me. The one who sins is the one who will die. Ah, so that is our answer. <laughs> Verse 5. Suppose there's a righteous man who does what is just and right. He does not eat at the mountain shrines or look to the idols of Israel. He does not defile his neighbor's wife or have sexual relations with a woman during her period. He does not oppress anyone but returns what he took in the pledge for a loan. He does not commit robbery but gives his food to the hungry and provides clothing for the naked. He does not lend to them at interest or take profit from them. He withholds his hand from doing wrong and judges fairly between two parties. He follows my decrees and faithfully keeps my laws. That man is righteous. He will surely live, declares the sovereign Lord. Suppose he has a violent son who sheds blood or does any of these things, though the father has done none of them. He eats at the mountain shrines, he defiles his neighbor's wife, he oppresses the poor needy, he commits robbery, he does not return what he took in pledge, he looks to the idols, he does detestable things, he lends at interest and takes a profit. Will such a man live? He will not, because he's done all these detestable things. He is to be put to death, his blood will be on his own head. But suppose this son has a son who sees all the sins his father commits, and though he sees them, he does not such things. He does not eat the mountain shrines or look to the idols of Israel. He does not defile his neighbor's wife. He does not oppress anyone or require a pledge for a loan. He does not commit robbery, but gives his food to the hungry, provides clothes for the naked, who withholds his hand from mistreating the poor and takes no interest or profit from them. He keeps my laws and follows my decrees. He will not die. For his father's sins, he surely will live. But his father will die for his own sins because he practiced extortion, robbed his brother, and did what was wrong among, among his people. Yet you ask, why does the son not share the guilt of his father? Since the son has done what is just and right, he has been careful to keep all my decrees, he will surely live. The one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. The righteous of the righteous will be credited to them, and the wicked of the wicked will be charged against them. But if a wicked person turns away from all the sins they have committed and keeps all my decrees and does what is just and right, the person will surely live, they will not die. None of the offenses they have committed will be remembered against them because of the righteous things they have done. They will live. Do I take pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? But if a righteous person turns from their righteousness and commits sin, and does the detestable things the wicked person does, will they live? None of the righteous things that person has done will be remembered. Because of the unfaithfulness, they are guilty. Because of the sins they have committed, they will die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. Hear you, Israelites, is my way unjust? Is it not your way that are unjust? If a righteous person turns from their righteousness and commits sin, they will die for it. Because the sin they have committed, they will die. But if a wicked person turns away from the wickedness they have committed and does what is just and right, they will save their life. Because they will consider all the offenses they have committed and turn away from them. The person will surely live. They will not die. Yet the Israelite says, The way of the Lord is not just. Are my ways unjust, people of Israel? Is it not your ways that are unjust? Therefore, you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent. Turn away from all your offenses, and sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all offenses you have committed, and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, people of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. Yes, that was a mouthful. So reading this, many will say, You see, the Lord does not hold the sins of my parents or my grandparents against me. I don't need deliverance, nor do I need to seek finding out about generational curses or iniquities because they don't affect me. I've heard that before. So I sat with the Lord for a few days pondering this, as I could hear the rebuttals in my head of the scriptures many use to not go near the idea of deliverance or dealing with generational curses because you're free already in Christ. I was a bit confused, too, and asked Holy Spirit, why does what my parents do and ancestors before me affect me if I, give my life to, if I gave my life to you? The scripture says that I'm not guilty, that I will live and not die. 
then why do we have to go through deliverance dealing with generational issues? Finally, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, because of sin. That the word of God is true. God no longer desires to punish souls because of their parents' sins or their ancestors' sins. However, when we sin, it gives legal access for the demons to enter into our lives and demons that have been dealing with our family for generations. They come rushing in to take their stance and authority in whatever area we've given them. Sin is a conduit to oppression and bondage. Even if we are in Christ and born again filled with the Holy Spirit, once we sin, even after we repent, we are forgiven by God. But there's consequences to our sin. Satan knows this, so let's say, for example, a covenant has been made by your ancestor through some ritual that has been passed down that seems like a superstition, where each child is bathed in some herbs at birth and words are spoken over the child to dedicate them to the family shrine, God, or even a family group like sorority or fraternity which have spirits behind them. Then you come along and Satan just lies in wait for you to sin. The moment you sin, it gives this generational covenant legal rights now to affect your life. Even after you've given your life to the Lord, you now belong to God, but when you sin, although Jesus forgives you, Satan comes rushing in again. And as Jesus said to Mother Claire, there are demons that wait in a line sometimes miles in length, waiting for an opportunity to slip in the open door when we fall into a type of sin. Pastor James tells us that covenants are just like iniquity. It never dies. 2 Samuel 21.1 Saul broke the covenant, and for 500 years, Israel had to pay for it. So even if your forefathers make a covenant with the river, or a deity, that covenant is still there. Isaiah 36 So the covenant of your forefathers still blinds you. You must cancel the handwritten ordinances of the covenant against you, Pastor James Kuala says. Cancel the spoken words against you all proclamations, declarations, and pin them to the cross. When you violate a covenant, you are judged, whether it's a covenant with God or even a covenant with Satan. So you no longer serve the gods of your ancestors or your forefathers, but you serve Jesus Christ. And now that evil covenant that the ancestors made will judge you because of it. So as I mentioned, when you sin, then that judgment takes form in your life. When you also terminate a contract, there's still consequences. So when your forefathers made a covenant, sacrifices was required of them. But because you're a Christian, you violate it. Because they need a sacrifice for that deity. Now you, they're no longer given a sacrifice. is a violation of that covenant or that ritual agreement that they had. So if you don't nail it to the cross, Pastor James says, it will follow you. The one who made the covenant with the deity of demonic spirit says, If my descendants cannot adhere to this covenant, then this and this will happen to them. Let's say, for example, in your family, nobody ever gets married or marriages are broken up or um, all the family members is always a mental illness or mental disorder or one child is sick or some type of obesity or some type of uh, an irregular disorder that runs in your family. They can be very likely, guys, a covenant that's been made. And even in the notes, Pastor James mentioned that if you're still dealing with some of these issues in your life, that means there's somebody in your family that is feeding this, feeding this deity, Feeding this covenant in your bloodline. Who's feeding it? We have to ask the Lord. And honestly, I was ignorant of many of these things, guys, before the Lord revealed all of this to me on the mountain, at the refuge. It took my breath away, and I cried some tears because I was overwhelmed at what the truth was concerning my family bloodline, and some members of my family even now. But the Lord equipped me then how to pray, how to fight in prayer, and also had to fight for their salvation too as well. So don't be afraid. If the Lord is leading you to listen to this message, it's because he wants to set you free. He wants to use you as a Joseph, you as David, you as Abraham, you as an Esther, to rise up, to dissolve curses in your family, to pin evil covenants to the cross, and to deal with the foundations in your bloodline. So that the next generation, your generation, can experience the freedom of Christ and his mercy as well. With all this said, I pray it gave you some things to ponder about, to seek the Lord about, and something to write down concerning your family foundations. Jesus put it on my heart for the next 13 days on the channel. I'll be sharing audio chapters from Pastor James' book, Freedom from Bondages in My Father's House. This book can be found on Amazon. I encourage all who are listening to please purchase this book. It's only $7.42. Please buy two and gift it to someone so they too can also be set free. Thank you, family. So tune in for the next few messages.